name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as you're aware, because I made mention of it earlier, we've designated this morning as uh, Graduation Sunday. And as we celebrate our graduates today, I want to take this opportunity to challenge them. This is for Northwinds Church. We've designated it as the Year of Impact. And I'm going to challenge the graduates to make an impact in this world. Just so you know, everything that I'm going to teach this morning is going to be every bit as applicable if you are not a graduate as if you are. So this is not one of those messages where you say, well, it's for the graduates so I can tune out. It doesn't really matter. I won't have to pay attention. No, this is for everyone. How can we make an impact? Now, normally whenever I give a list or you give a list, you put the important things at the top, right? And the not-so-important things make their way somewhat down on the list. I'm going to use IMPACT as an acronym this morning, but the T, when we get to it, is every bit as important as the I that starts things off. Okay, now, here's what you need to know right off the bat. I'm going to have six points to this morning's message. Normally, my messages have one, two, at the most, three things that I say, hey, I really want you to latch on to these two things. I feel like most of the time at the end of the message, it's like, hey, there's two challenges, right? There's two challenges, and here's what they are. I have six, so here's what that should immediately spark in your mind. I need to take notes. There's no way I can remember six points to a message. You can't even remember the six letters in your password, right? Yeah, I know how it is. My mom's the worst. And by the way, my mom watches these messages. She will be able to hear me say this. She's the worst. Mom, do you know what your password is? No, how am I supposed to know what my password is for this? Now, she started keeping a book, uh, which has been very, very helpful in that. Or you could be like me. I use the same password for absolutely everything, except for whenever, every once in a while, it asks for a special character and then a number. And so it goes from being a password to, okay, how many exclamation points at the end or how many numbers do I have to use? And then I do get confused. And then we all use that favorite thing, reset password, and it sends us an email and we're all set. All that to say this, most likely we can't remember six points of a message, even though it's an acronym that is going to spell out impact, I would encourage you, even if you have to bust out your digital device and you go to your notes section on your phone just to take some notes on this, I think every point is going to be important. It's something that you need to be able to latch on to. And again, for our seniors, I'm challenging you with these things. So here are the, I'm going to give you the six points, then we're going to teach our way through. So I... Students, graduates, and this applies to everyone, but I'm just basically going to talk to them for the rest of the time. The rest of you get to listen. But graduates, I want you to invest in others. That's the I. I want you to invest in others. The M, when you're thinking of making an impact, I want you to mimic the Savior, mimic Jesus. And every time, when I'm saying this, I just, I want to teach these points before I get to them, but I'm, I'm going to avoid doing that. The P, I'm going to need you, we're going to need you, as a church, we're going to challenge you to persevere in your faith. It's not always going to be easy. The A, I want you to anchor yourself in God's promises. Anchor yourself in God's promises. The C, you might not so much want to hear this one. But there's going to be times, many times, that you are going to need to confess your sin. Confess your sin. Then we finally get to the T, which as I said, is every bit as important as what the I, the M, the P, the A, and the C are. You need to trust in the Lord in every part of your life and for all time. So again, invest in others, mimic the Savior, persevere in your faith, Anchor yourself in God's promises, confess your sin, and then trust the Lord always. So let's go with the first one, the I, investing in others. We live in a culture, and this culture hasn't changed a lot, this part of it. Our culture is changing a lot, but this part of the culture really hasn't changed a lot. Ever since really Adam and Eve were created, and then they've got to make their own choices 
people have been living for self. They're all about me. It's a me culture. How can I advance myself in life? How can I get ahead? How can I, 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 me, it's all about me. That's our culture. But again, it's not anything new in culture. That's just the way that it's always been. If you would go in your Bibles, by the way, we are going to be all over the place. If you're here normally, uh, you know that we typically like to go to a passage. Uh, We've been preaching chronologically through the Gospels for about three and a half years now. Uh, We normally will go straight to a passage, we'll teach our way through it, so we're not usually bouncing around a lot, but this morning is a different type of message, and I hope you're okay with that. If you're not, you're still here, and so you're going to have to be okay with it to some degree. But we're going to be all over the place. We're going to start in Genesis chapter number 3. Genesis 3, 6 says this, it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom... She took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. It was all about what looked good for them, seemed good to them. It was all about them. And in our humanity, we naturally revert to self. But Jesus set the perfect example of living for others, living to invest in the lives of others. When you think about the amount of time he spent with his disciples, And then even beyond the disciples, oftentimes, many times throughout the Gospels, as we've been studying through them, we have seen that there are small crowds, large crowds that are following Jesus. Jesus invested in people. Not too long ago, we looked at a passage in Matthew chapter number 20, and you can go ahead and you can turn there as well, where a couple of the disciples, along with their mother, They go to Jesus and they want to have a special place in his kingdom. They they feel like, so we're getting close to Jerusalem and he's going to set up his kingdom. They had a misunderstanding of what he was doing, but they knew one thing. They wanted to have a special place in the kingdom. Hey, is it possible, the mom says, that one of my sons can sit on your right hand and the other can sit on the left The other disciples, they heard about it, and they were upset. In fact, the word that's used is they were indignant. We find Jesus then calling all of the disciples together and teaching them what was really important, and that was to serve. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 says this, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus knew that he came to fulfill the mission of the Father. The mission of the Father was to invest in people. It was to reconcile broken humanity with the Holy One and true God. He came to do that and he invested in his disciples and then he sent them out. For you students, for you graduates, we, it has been our privilege and pleasure to invest in your lives. Pastor Alex has been here for four months now, right? Right? Has it been five months already? Wow, it doesn't seem like it's been that long. But uh, he's been here for five months. Pastor Kirk and I have been here for a reasonably longer portion than that, and Steve as well. And we have enjoyed the opportunity to invest in you. And we want to be able to some degree to send you out to invest in others. My challenge to you graduates as you think about making an impact is to invest in other people. I know a lot of people who live for themselves. I know a lot of people who they take a lot of time and try to do a lot of self-improvement. And those are usually some of the most unhappy people that I've met. Those people that are all about, okay, what can I do to make myself happy? What can I do to, and, and it's just all about themselves. They're usually very, very unhappy. Some of the people filled with the most joy are those who see their calling of investing in other people. I'm telling you, like, I get the privilege, I've had the privilege almost all of my, well, actually all of my adult life to invest in people. And even before I was an adult, I had the privilege of being able to invest in people. And there are benefits to getting older. There are a number of challenges to getting older, to which a lot of you should at that point say, amen. Amen. The joints hurt, 
you know, thing, it, there are, but there are blessings, and some of those blessings are looking back on people that we've had the opportunity to invest in. Uh, I can look back to students that we've had and students on the mission field now that it just brings us a lot of joy to know I got to be a small, we got to be a small part of that. Uh, looking back to uh, so many that are now serving as leaders in their churches and it's a privilege looking back. I, I had one student who texted me and she's had a number of children and she said, hey, I just want you to know uh, I, I gave one of our sons your, middle, your, your name and it's his middle name. Like such a privilege that so I'm like, oh my word, that the Lord would allow me that opportunity. And I want to say to your students, I know that people have been asking you for the last, it seems like forever, hey, what are you doing? Whenever you graduate, how many of you graduates have had people ask you, what are you doing when you graduate? Right? It's always like, hey, what are you doing? What are you, you, you? And it's been about you. I want to challenge you to be looking to invest in others, even whenever it seems like it's about you. I want to challenge you. It's not about you. Invest in someone else. Invest in other people. If you find yourself feeling a little bit down about yourself, Invest in someone else, and you'll be amazed at how that just picks you up. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 say, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each one should look not only to his own needs, but also to the needs of others. As you move into the next phase of life where parental influence isn't quite as in your face, where you make more independent decisions, when the focus can easily become me, 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 me. I want to challenge you to see the needs of others. 1 John 3, 18, another very good passage, says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but in actions and in truth. Put into practice. I saw on a sign one time, the smallest good deed is better than the grandest good intention. Put into practice the important principle that Jesus laid out for us, that he came to minister to people, not to be ministered to. He came to serve people, not just to be served. I want to challenge you to do that. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians the second time, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, we read these words. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. What God is doing in our lives is not only for our good, and we know Romans 8, 28, right? We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. We know that. But when God is working in our lives, it's not only for our benefit. It's also for the good of others. Have you been hurt by the church? You can help those who have experienced the same. I have said many times, my greatest hurts have always come at the hands of Christians. My greatest hurts in life always come at the hands of Christians. But you know what that allows me to do? It allows me to empathize with those who have been hurt by the church as well. I would imagine that the large majority of you sitting here this morning have experienced what many refer to as church hurt. You have had somebody in the church say something rude. You have been treated wrongly by the church. Uh, you've had a leader who just demeaned you and put you down. I, I can relate to all of those things. God allows us these experiences to be able to relate with others. Have you maybe doubted your faith? You can then help some who inevitably are going to doubt their faith as well. In a, I've been doing ministry now for 23 plus years. I've always encouraged people, don't, just, don't feel like you can't ask questions. Ask the hard questions about faith. God isn't this small God who can't answer your questions. God can meet you at your point of questioning, and he can reveal himself to you. He uses his word to do that as well. But you can help those who have doubted their faith. I think of Josh McDowell, who set out saying, you know what? I, 
I don't, I'm not going to, not only am I not going to believe in God, I am going to disprove God and Christianity. And then God met him right at his point of need. And then what has he done now? He has written books such as The Evidence That Demands a Verdict, to where he is showing others how they can question and find answers to the deep things of faith. Have you experienced great loss and been comforted by your loving Heavenly Father? You can also help those going through loss as well. We're not designed to make life about ourselves. We are designed to glorify God. And do you remember what Jesus said? It's a verse that I have tried to commit to memory. It's found in John chapter number 17, verse 4. Jesus says as he's getting toward the end of his life, he's praying to his father and he says, I have brought you glory on earth. How did I bring you glory on earth? I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. I know that God's work in your life involves other people. I know that God's work in your life involves other people. There was a time in my life where I said I could go live on a mountainside and never talk to another person in my life. Just get me away from people. Anybody ever felt that way, by the way? He's like, just get me away from people. I'm so so thankful that the Lord has changed my heart in that regard. I love being around people now. I'm actually, like, the beginning of COVID was hard on me because I just so much like being around people. I kind of go nuts if I'm not around people now. Like, God changed me. I know that God's plan for your life involves people. Jesus brought glory to God by completing his mission, and his mission was to seek and to save the lost. If you want to make an impact, invest in others. Serve them as Jesus did. Well, the second thing, you say, Pastor Dave, if every point takes as long as that, not every point is going to take as long as the first one. It is important to invest in others. The second point is that I want you to mimic the Savior. I want you to mimic Jesus. Now, most of the time when we think about mimicking someone, we think of our annoying brother or sister who whenever we say something, they say what we just said, right? And so you're in the car and you're traveling and all of a sudden one of the siblings decides that they're going to mimic one of the other siblings. How many of you have ever had that happen? Your sibling has started mimicking you, all right? Those of you that have had that happen, how many of you have gotten annoyed by that, right? We usually, consider, we usually think of mimicking as like bringing difficulty to someone by, by imitating or mimicking uh, their behavior. I'm not, I'm not talking about annoying Jesus by, by emulating his behavior, but I am talking about Doing the things that he did, thinking the way that he thought. Usually whenever you have that brother or sister who mimics your every statement or your every movement, it gets really interesting whenever you get to the stop mimicking me. Stop doing everything that I do. Normally, parents, you know this is true. Right after you hear that, you know that something violent is about to happen. (laughs) Am I right about that? You know that if you don't step in, something's going to go down. And that's something that's going to go down. It's probably going to mean that you're going to have to use some towels to clean up blood. You're going to have to repair. So you know, but that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about emulating, mimicking the behavior of Jesus, but not in a way that brings any sort of disdain. When we're talking about mimicking Jesus, we are not making fun of him. We're not mocking him, but we're talking about imitating him. The compassion that he has, we want to have. Graduates, I want you to have the same compassion for your fellow man that Jesus has for mankind. The grace that he extends. Adults, you know what I'm talking about. It's hard to make it through this life without being an ultra bitter human being if you're not willing to extend grace. You know why? Because we live in a world of imperfect people. In fact, if you are sitting anywhere near someone, just look at them right now. And you don't have to say these words, but you can if you want to. You can say, you are imperfect. Husbands and wives, you're probably like, okay, am I speaking up at this point? Should I not speak up at this point? You make your own decision on that. But the reality is, whoever you are sitting next to is sitting next to an imperfect person. I feel like Debbie and Alex are having a little stare down up here. Like. I felt bad because I told her. <laughs> well, you told her the truth. 
D- now, now, okay, so, 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 so let, yeah, so let's, let's have a little interaction here. All right, you told, you told her that, and I told her you told her. Did you speak the truth in love? I think so. Okay, good, good, good. Then you're okay. You're sitting next to it. The reality is this, and, and I want to bring this right back. If you aren't willing to extend grace in your life, you are going to live with a lot of bitterness. Because hurts will happen. There will be tr- people who treat you wrongly. Oh my goodness, how wrongly have we treated our Savior? And yet, in the morning we are met with His mercy. Like each day we are surrounded and overwhelmed by His grace. As we are imitating Him, we should be showing that same, same grace to others. <clears throat> what about forgiveness? We talk about bitterness. Shouldn't forgiveness be extended in the same way that Jesus extends forgiveness to us? What about the way that he thinks? We should think that way as well. And the list could just go on and on and on. You'll never go wrong following the example of Jesus. We looked at a couple of verses in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4 a little while ago. I want to look at verse 5 now. So immediately following the verses we looked at, Philippians chapter number 2, verse 5 says this, And depending on your version, I'm going to give you two different versions here. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Some versions would say this, let this mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus. Have the mind of Christ, have the attitude of Christ. Mimic the way that he thinks. And again, if you're going to mimic the way that he thinks, if you're going to imitate the way that he thinks then you let your neighbor is no longer your enemy. Your neighbor is someone that you are to love. And so often we look back when we think about who is our neighbor, the question that's asked, and you think about the Good Samaritan. We should show kindness and mercy and empathy to everyone. I love what Paul writes in the first book of Corinthians. We looked at the second book here just a moment ago. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he says something that has always been challenging to me. I'm going to paraphrase it. Well, I'll read the actual thing. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I actually had a t-shirt made one time for our youth ministry that said this, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, if you're going to throw that t-shirt on, and you know that everywhere you walk, you're going to have people saying, oh, that person says that they're a Christian. It's going to be a challenge for the way that you live. But Paul writes and he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So as you mimic your Savior, others should be able to mimic you. If the only picture of Christ that they see is you, make it an accurate portrayal of who Jesus is. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2 says, Be imitators of God as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. I'm going to speak just truth to you here this morning, graduates. If you are going to imitate, if you are going to mimic your Savior, It is going to, at times, lead to hardship. It is, at times, going to lead to difficult circumstances and challenges. In the same way that Christ sacrificed for us, we should be willing to sacrifice for others. Jesus showed perfectly the love of the Father, and we should seek to show that same love to others. One more verse on this challenge. Acts chapter number 4. Peter and John, they've been arrested. They're in front of the Sanhedrin, which is a religious ruling body of the time. They give a very strong defense of their faith. And they say in Acts chapter 4, verse number 12, these words. They say, salvation is found in none other or in no one else. For there is no other name given under heaven to men by which we must be saved. Salvation is found in Jesus, they said. They give this really strong defense. The very next verse, Acts chapter 4, verse 13 says this. This is the reaction of the people. When they saw the courage of Peter and John 
and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Oh, that it would be said of you. Oh, that it would be said of all of us. Wow, that person must have been with Jesus. I would love if when you go out of this place and somebody knows that you are a part of North Winds Church, they'd say, oh, man, you know what? That person is a person of high character. That person loves unconditionally. That person displays such grace for a young person. It's pretty remarkable. I would love that people would say of you as graduates, they have been with Jesus, and I can tell the difference. The third challenge I want to give you, this is the P in impact, is to persevere in your faith. You may already know this, but life will not always be easy. Jesus said in John 16, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, leave that up there if we can, because you'll notice that I only read the second half of that verse. I did that intentionally. I only read the second half, which says this, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. I want to go ahead and back up and read the entire thing now. Jesus said, I have told you these things. What were those things? Well, what he had just told them was he, Jesus, was going to go through, he's talking about the cross, he's talking about the sufferings that he's about to to endure. He says, I'm about to go through a lot of trouble, a lot of difficulties, but that he wouldn't be alone in his trouble. The Father would always be with him. And again, you can go back and you can look at this in John 16. So he says, listen, listen. I'm going to go through this this whole bunch of trouble. I'm about to go to the cross, but the Father's never going to leave me. And so Jesus says, listen, I've told you about the trouble I'm going to face so that in me you can have peace. You know that I'm about to go through trouble and God's never going to leave me. You're going to go through difficulty. In this world, you're going to have trouble. That's exactly what Jesus said. If this was a red letter edition of the Bible put on the screen, these are the words of Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble. Graduates, you are going to have trouble in this world. But take heart, persevere, because why? He's overcome the world. He's overcome the world. You already have victory in Christ. And trust me, graduates, there are going to be times that you feel defeated. Adults, you know this, right? There are times when you feel defeated. There are times when you feel defeated in your faith. But you need to take heart. Because we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We serve the one who has already overcome the world. We're challenged in the book of Hebrews. This is Hebrews 10, 23, by the way. It says this, let us hold unswervingly. Everybody say unswervingly just because it's a fun word to say. Say unswervingly. unswervingly. Like, isn't that a fun word? Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. There may be times when you don't understand God and His plan. There may be times when you're angry with God. There may be times when you feel you want to curse God. It's at those times when you need to hold unswervingly to our hope in Christ. I want you to picture this. You're probably only a couple years into driving. But imagine driving, and I've experienced this myself. I can think of one particular instance When I was in in Pennsylvania, we were traveling back from an amusement park in 15 passenger vans responsible for all of these students. And it was, as they would say, raining cats and dogs. Like it was pouring in ways that I can't remember it pouring. And do you know how I was driving? And you get back, some of you have driven this way and your shoulders are so tense, your neck hurts, your head hurts because you're just like... I can't let go of this steering wheel. I want you to think of holding on to your faith that way. To hold unswervingly to the hope that you have in Christ. To not in any way just, oh, you know, whatever. No, hold unswervingly to your faith. The fourth point that I want to challenge you with is built kind of off the previous one. So persevering in your faith. So we go to I, M, P, then we get to the A. And I want your your hope and your faith to be anchored in the promises 
of God. I want them to be anchored in the promises of God. There's an old hymn that I sang a lot growing up, and it still comes to mind somewhat frequently. I'm guessing that at least some of you in here have sung this as well, and it's called Standing on the Promises, right? Standing on the promises of Christ my King. If I could sing, I would sing it right about now. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. And then you have the chorus, right? Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Look in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 6, verses 13 through 20. Hebrews chapter number 6, verses 13 through 20 says this, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. And you know what? You you understand this part, right? When there was no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. Like, I'm going to keep this promise. I'm a Survivor fan, the, the, the reality show Survivor. I've watched every season, every episode. Uh, I get annoyed by it every once in a while, if I'm being honest. But I, I'm a Survivor fan. And in Survivor... It's one of those things where whenever you look at this, well, who do you swear by? I remember this one particular contestant, and he would swear by his his grandmother's grave. He would swear by his kids. He would swear by everything that there was sacred, so to speak. But he was lying through his teeth. But you always choose to, quote, unquote, swear by something greater than yourself, right? Because it's already your word. But here it's saying, listen, God couldn't swear by anything great. There is nothing greater than God. There is no one greater than him. And so when he said, I'm going to keep my promises, he says, listen, I, I, Yahweh, I, the great I am, I will keep my promise because I am God and I am faithful. That's who I am. It's just his complete character. It's who Jesus is and who God is. And so when it says God made this promise to Abraham, and by the way, the promise to Abraham to make a great nation We would not have done well with the promise to Abraham. Abraham didn't do well with the promise to Abraham, if we're being really honest. But you know, it wasn't the very next year that he fulfilled that promise to Abraham. It wasn't two years down the road that he fulfilled that promise to Abraham. It wasn't even five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the road that he fulfilled that promise to Abraham. It was 25 years before he had a son. 25 years I want you to hold on to the promises of God. God is faithful. He will never break a promise to you. And if you know this promise, and listen, it's very easy to look up. What are the promises of God? And there might be a specific one that you hold on to for a time in your life. And God gives you that promise and you hang on to it. One of them that you need to make sure you always understand. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And what's the promise? I will give you rest. The promises of God are so near and dear to us. The older you get, I believe, the more you value the promises of God. But young people, graduates, anchor yourself in God's promises. It goes on and it says, listen, saying, he swore by his own name. He says, saying, verse 14, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose. Notice that again. He wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible for God to lie. Your parents try not to lie. Right? But sometimes, and I know as a parent, I know I have lied to my kids. I don't think I've ever intentionally lied to my kids. But sometimes I'll say, hey, when I'm done with this, then I will. And then something comes up. And after that, I don't. And kids are usually really good at remembering whenever we say, hey, 
after this, we're going to go to the park, and then something comes up, and we can't go to the park. God never lies. He never lies. And so it says it's impossible for God to lie. We who have fled to take hold of the hope that is offered to us, we can be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor, and that's our word, right, in, in the acronym. Anchor ourselves in God's promises. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He's become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. God kept his promises to Jesus, his son. God kept his promises to Abraham. God has kept every promise and he'll keep his promises to you. Anchor yourself in those promises. We're down to the last two challenges. If you're going to make an impact, you're going to need to, and I said this at the beginning, this might be your least favorite one, but it's oh so important. You're going to need to confess your sin. You're going to have to acknowledge that God is right and you have been wrong. Listen, God has done that in my life, and I'm so thankful. This church family has set a good example for you graduates. This is one of the few church families that I've ever been around, and I pray that we always stay this way. Sometimes as, as people come in, it is hard to maintain the same culture, but I think the culture is so prevalent that it will continue to be this way. This is one of the few churches where you guys actively encourage me to teach God's Word Go ahead and be as blunt as you need to be, Pastor Dave, because if God's word says that I'm wrong, I want to know that I'm wrong. And if God's word says that my attitude needs to change, then I want to know that my attitude needs to change. I don't want you to just pat me on the back, make me feel all good, and send me out. I want you to tell me what the word of God says. I'm so thankful for the example set by the adults in this church family who have had that mindset ever since I can remember. I, I have sat down with some of you, and I have said to you, Listen, here's what God's word says about the way that you're living. And you, you've said, oh, my goodness, I need to line up with what God says. I have sat down with some of you and showed you how God's word says that your attitudes and your actions have been wrong. And you have time and time again said, thank you. Thank you for showing me that. That's not normal, by the way. Normally, people are resistant to someone saying, hey, God's word says this is wrong. Graduates, I want you to know you're going to have to confess your sin on a regular basis if you are going to make an impact in this world. We were talking as men yesterday about how it's important that as we're leading our families, we are willing to acknowledge when we're wrong. Because if we're not willing as men to acknowledge when we're wrong, when we have just blown it, I don't normally like to use my kids as examples, and this is more me as an example than it is my kids, but I specifically remember one time with Kylie that I was in a bad mood. I don't normally get in bad moods, but I was, I was, I was stressed, and I was very short with her. We were by the sink. I don't remember all the things that I said, but I was just really not very nice. And I can remember standing there feeling the conviction of that and walking upstairs and saying to her, and this has been years ago, so I doubt that you even remember this. Do you remember this? Kind of. I remember walking upstairs and saying to her, I am so sorry. I snapped at you. You haven't done anything wrong. I have no idea why I'm acting like a jerk. I might not have used those exact words, but I was, I was, a, I was wrong. It was wrong of me to treat her that way. We need to, adults, we need to graduates, we need to young people, we need to retirees, whoever you may be, we need to confess. And confess is to agree with God that He is right and that we are wrong. We need to confess when we are wrong. And we have the wonderful uh, verse that many of you have memorized in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When God, through His Holy Spirit, shows us that our attitude is wrong, that we have been lax in our purity, when we're using language that we shouldn't, when God brings those things to our attention, it is right, graduates, it is right, people here today, to admit and to acknowledge He is right and we are wrong. The last point. And as I said at the beginning, it isn't the least of the points, it's just the last of the points, is the T, and that is to, if you're going to make an impact, you need to trust in Jesus 
every moment of your life. And you need to trust Him with every area of your life. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, very familiar verses say this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Or some versions would say He will make your paths straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. The scriptures say there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. Your most natural inclination is most likely not the right inclination. The natural man is opposed to the spiritual man, to the spirit who works inside of us. So we need to trust in the Lord. If you haven't, first of all, trusted Him as your Savior, and this again, for everyone, not just the graduates, if you haven't trusted in Jesus as your Savior, your Rescuer, your Redeemer, you need to do that. If you have trusted Him as your Savior, then my guess is right about now the Holy Spirit is working on your heart to reveal to you areas that you aren't trusting Him in. I'm looking out at a lot of parents, and I know that parents, sometimes we find it difficult to trust God completely with the future of our children. We sometimes feel as if we can't really trust Him with their safety, with their development, with their decision making. And so we try to keep a tight hold, trust the Lord in everything. Graduates, as you go off to school or as you enter the workforce, uh, as you go to your next phase of life, life I want to encourage you, you'll never go wrong trusting in the Lord. You put your future in His hands, He's got you. You put your actions in your, His hands, He's got you. He's going to have you in everything. Put your complete confidence in Him. So a review of these six points, and I close. Invest in others. Be wise about that. Serve them. Mimic the Savior. Imitate who He is in, in the mind of Christ, the actions and the attitudes of Christ. Persevere in your faith. It'll get difficult. Your faith will be challenged if you're going to go to, to a school that isn't going to be intentional about their faith. You're going to be challenged with what you believe. Persevere in your faith. Anchor yourself in God's promises. An anchor holds, holds a ship fast, holds it in position, and your faith needs to be anchored in God's promises. Confess your sin. Acknowledge when you are wrong and He is right. And He is always right. <laughs> it's just a matter of we try to line up with him as often as we can. When you don't, then you confess that. And then finally, trust the Lord at all times. You'll make an impact if you do those six things. Father, thank you for your word, for the clarity of it. Thank you for these graduates. I have had the privilege of watching them grow and watching them develop, watching them grow in their faith, watching them overcome challenges, watching many of them trust you, when it didn't seem like there was a lot of hope. And I'm thankful that you have been faithful and you will always be faithful. Lord, I pray for these graduates that they would make an impact. I pray that for all of us, that we would remember these challenges and we would live them out. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna invite you to stand. We're going to sing a song. After the song, I'm going to come back up and we're going to